Tales from my D&D campaign. Previously. A clay golem? Aren't those weaker than the other golem we fought? I think this may be a dark ancient. The others attempted to deal with you too indirectly. It is time to rectify their error. And Krillin's like, this is nuts! I should just grab my wife and fly away. Alright, I activate my very expensive scroll of break enchantment. With its dominate broken, the Dark Ancient found itself all alone and surrounded by some very pissed off heroes. And the clay golem becomes inert. You rode here with such haste. Please explain the incident, Lady Von Kristoff. A Diluvian peace offer. Duke Von Kristoff of Newland. He jumped off the wall? Killing the peace messenger? The lady did apologize for that. There's an unknown ship approaching the castle docks. Uh, forgive me, my lady, your highness, but it's not a ship. It's a small boat. A boat? Castle, the capital of Vistria, was built long ago as a point of strength, a pinnacle from which to rule, and a bulwark to which men could retreat in times of direst need, which the king and his people could hold against any siege. And so the great fortress was built at the meeting point of the Twin Mountains, where it was flanked on two sides by rock faces which, if not unclimbable, could certainly not be scaled by any army. The front would be defended by great walls, while at the back lay a steep path straight down to the crashing waves, as the sheer sides of the mountain plunged far down below the surface of the Crimson Sea. In this treacherous harbor, utterly unreachable by land, they had to resort to magic to set the piers of the dock, which would allow a sturdy ship with a skilled pilot to moor, meaning that the capital could be resupplied securely by sea, even if besieged by land. And so Castle, which includes the Citadel, the main defensive structure, the Palace, the inner sanctum where the royal family resides, as well as the dense city within the outer walls, held fast for generations before the men of Istria made contact with the underwater-dwelling Aventi, a people who appear much like humans with gills. And it was only then that the descendants of the smith became aware that a great deal more was going on beneath the waves than they had ever imagined. As humans explored and then solidified their control of the remainder of the Vistrian Peninsula, the Kuatoa of the Diluvian Empire expanded across the bottom of the ocean, devouring their few remaining neighbors, and the rulers of Vistria began to realize that all of Castle's strength was facing in the wrong direction. And so today, as the royal court, along with our heroes, looked down from the walls of the citadel to the ocean, it was a very different sight than the ancient path down to the dockhouse. Row after row, seven tiers of great walls wound back and forth between the twin mountains. Each battlement was twenty feet across at the top and even thicker at the base, in some places carved into the mountains themselves, but most of it filled with crushed rock and sand, compartmentalized by internal walls to withstand the torrents of alchemical acids which would be unleashed upon it in a diluvian siege. Hundreds upon hundreds of crossbowmen and other soldiers manned these walls, along with great ballistas and other siege weapons, and with the gates of each tier guarded by stone golems, including a quartet of huge golems over twenty feet tall at the outer gates, and approaching this monolith of stone and steel, floating steadily through rough surf towards the docks, was a small wooden rowboat. It looks like an elf. It's a sea elf in fancy clothing. And there's nobody rowing? There are probably a dozen other slaves underneath, helping maneuver it. I did not expect their second messenger to arrive so swiftly. Ah, uh, it's really just a sea elf? A collaborator. I bet he gets fancy clothes and cushy jobs in return for helping oppress his own people. I wouldn't call this a cushy job, given what happened to the last messenger. I was hoping for a monitor. Speak for yourself. The kings and their advisers decided their course of action, though Marshal Redpath did not seem happy with the level of security. The messenger would be searched for weapons and admitted, led up to the fourth tier by an escort of soldiers and golems, where the kings would hear him out from a solid hundred feet away through the massive portcullis of the next tier. The sea elf, for his part, took their paranoia in stride allowing his expensive robes to be searched and for the heavy forces to lead him up away from any underwater reinforcements, but still far enough below the citadel to provide some defensive depth for the monarchs to fall back should trouble arise. And at every turn, dozens upon dozens of crossbowmen trained their weapons on the messenger as he passed, flashing a brilliant smile to any who would meet his eyes, and ignoring the harsh barking of their dogs. 
Raven and Zaheer arrayed themselves on the inner wall of the courtyard where the meeting was to take place, flanked by their protectors, while Angel and Little One placed themselves with the heavily armored palace guard who stood below them, as did Father Fields and Chrysanthemum. Wish I had my real armor. Beyond the gate waited the royal court, several of them considered dangerous in their own right, and of course flanked by more of the hand-picked royal guard. The aquatic elf seemed very much at ease, despite the show of force. If anything, amused to be treated as though he were some kind of dangerous wizard. Or a monitor. I'm looking all around for anyone invisible. Yeah, I don't like the barking either. I agree, but on the other hand, he's still an aquatic slave. It is possible that he really is what they're worked up about. The dogs definitely got more riled as he approached, and the ones further down in the lower tiers seem to have been calmed by their handlers. So the barking does appear to have followed this guy. Or the real source followed him up. Well, you don't see anything, but you keep a keen eye out. I am Rolo, humble servant of House Valoon. The divine Emperor Kurov has chosen to extend a most generous offer to his highness, King Edward von Smith, Lord of Vistria. His offer is peace. Peace and a gift of the disputed lands north of a line drawn between Dream Lake and Shale Keep an area of roughly 100,000 square miles. The mighty Diluvian Empire will withdraw all forces from that area, including our camps and any fortresses, save for the Crimson Sea Bastion, and our military presence within Dream Lake itself will be reduced to the level of militia. Additionally, you would be granted control of the surface of the Crimson Sea out to a distance of 50 miles from your shores, including fishing rights to a depth of 200 feet. In exchange for this benevolence, you would agree not to construct any fortresses within this new demilitarized zone, and your military forces within that zone would be limited to no more than 100 troops per civilian settlement. Furthermore, your navy would be frozen at its current size, your construction of warships would be strictly limited to replacement, only to maintain current levels. You are offering a return of a quarter of Verandi and the fisheries, and all your emperor wants in return is that we not militarize that space? In other words, you want us to expose thousands of civilians with no defense against you. If you accept my master's offer and respect the demilitarized zone, you can do with his gifts as you will. You can move all of your people there, or none of them. Leave the ghost towns and empty fields to the Ankegs. Keep your fishermen in the frigid waters of the north, and garrison your little fortresses against an enemy who never comes. It matters not, but you will have no more need to fear every time your dogs bark. My lord... Accepting this offer and the military constraints would be seen by many as conceding the remainder of Verandi to decades or centuries of Diluvian control. I don't know if you've noticed, but the Diluvians already control it. This choice will divide my people, no matter what is decided. If this offer could be trusted, safe fishing in the Southern Sea, combined with a third of Verandi's farmland, would virtually solve your people's food issues. Speaking of gifts, as a gesture of goodwill, I am to present you with a lost memento of the Verandi dynasty. From the folds of his robes, he slowly pulls out a small blue seashell encased in a web of coral hung on a silver chain. I have never seen that necklace, yet I would know it anywhere. Bring it here. A member of the royal guard steps out to go get it, but Father Fields beats him there effortlessly. The messenger holds out the amulet in a generous posture, but Fields makes no move to take it. The darkly dressed man just looms over the diminutive sea elf, who stares back up at him, first confused, then with growing unease. He starts to shrink away from the human, and only then does Fields snatch the jewelry from the messenger's palm. Will you check this for us, Maki, to make sure it is safe? I suppose I could. He tosses it up without turning. Make a roll and add your reflex save bonus. A reflex save? Uh, not a save, just to see if you catch it. Draven studies the amulet for a tense minute, but pronounces it safe. It's a very old minor artifact which grants water breathing and gives the wearer damage reduction against slashing and bludgeoning attacks while underwater. This was a token of peace. 
given to my ancestors by the Aventi when we first made contact with the peoples of the sea. It was lost in the fall. Father Fields had withdrawn, once Draven vouched for the amulet, and Rollo managed to recover enough composure to resume his oration. If you accept this offer, great king of men, there will be room to haggle over trivium, such as the definition of troops or of a warship. But make no mistake, the emperor's will is clear. If there is to be peace, this will be its shape. You have but two options before you, to accept peace or to reject peace. Having known the rough details since Chrysanthemum's presentation, the party had discussed the Diluvian peace offer in great detail, but the debate always turned kind of circular. The king should definitely take the deal. It's obviously a trap. Why else would they make the offer? We get back all that farmland for free, and they'll stop attacking us? and my ancestral lands. It seems too good to be true. Even if they launch a surprise attack in five years, or two years, or whatever, our side can use that time to build up. It costs Fistria nothing. Doesn't the treaty limit the number of soldiers in Verandi? The number per civilian settlement. You can just make loads of tiny settlements. Or disguise the soldiers as farmers. Disguise them? Isn't this the empire with uh, countless invisible spies? Meh. Details. What do they gain by making the treaty if they're just going to break it shortly after? What's the point? It does kind of seem like if they really tried, they could just conquer us right now. They're devoting most of their efforts to fighting the Elu down south. They probably don't even consider Vistria to be a threat. Which means the peace treaty might let them focus all their resources to actually win the civil war down south. They've been fighting for like a hundred years. The Elu aren't going to drop overnight. 300 years. See? The king should definitely take the deal. And one other detail wasn't lost on them. Look at the other border of the treaty area. Yeah, they're proposing to give back everything that borders on gruel. It's like giving the gift of orcs. Our divine emperor understands that you may need time to decide. The self-imposed Diluvian ceasefire will continue for three more weeks, but after that time... My lord's generous offer will be withdrawn. Until then, you can signal your acceptance by flying blue flags from the high towers of the citadel. I must consult with my vassals, and three weeks is physically too short a time to hear back from the northwest provinces. Perhaps, but you are the king of men. The divine emperor Kurov is confident that you can make a decision. Three weeks, your highness. Then he turned to leave, and the troops, after looking for King Edward's permission, began to escort him back towards the docks, when several things happened in rapid succession. Little one spotted motion, an invisible shape bolting swiftly out of cover towards the messenger. A monitor! He started to act, but the figure was fast, and a full round's movement away from him. Hearing his cry, Angel focused on that area, where she stood a decent chance of spotting even an invisible target as long as it was moving, but motion up on the other wall distracted her. Ah! There were gasps from soldiers all around, and even the golems pause, awaiting orders. Who fired that shot? The crossbowmen look around, still shocked that someone from their own ranks had fired at the peace envoy without orders, and sergeants scrambled to try and identify the shooter. If I get over there, I can find out with detect thoughts. How far down is it if I jump? You're on the high side of the road, so you're 50 feet up. Jumping down reduces the effect of falling distance by 10 feet, but you still take 4d6 damage. Mahar will slide down. Show off. But is it going to be a fight? Fields and the guards on this side of the porkless are advancing to broadly encircle the threat, while Lady Redpath and the council are practically dragging the kings away, surrounded by the remaining royal guard. But Little One, with his dragon's eyes, had started moving long before anyone else, and now stood only a few feet from what was clearly a Diluvian monitor. Th thank you. My mission was only to keep you alive until you reached the king. You're lucky that I'm bored, and that I consider you marginally less worthless than the coward who fires anonymously from a mob to strike a weakling in the back. You can feel the power of his chi. It practically radiates off him, unlike any other warrior you've faced. 
His level in martial classes is higher than yours, though not massively higher. You may be the only nation ever to be given a yes or no choice whether or not to exist. I hope you choose slaughter. This is our chance to kill a monitor. Are you going to do it? Because I'll totally jump down. Like, who cares about 46? I really want to fight one of these guys. From a purely tactical standpoint, he is at a tremendous disadvantage. He's given up his stealth, and he's surrounded by freaking golems. There's no way he can win. He, he can't be that powerful. I would have to agree, but he is not attacking, is he? The monitor can see Little One's advanced martial stance. It's like he can sense how anxious you are to attack. And he leans in. I am under orders not to start anything today. But I can act in self-defense. You don't want to see how I define self-defense. It sounds like he wants you to. I'm sure we can take him. Even if he can deflect a hundred bolts around, we can beat him here. He must have awesome equipment. You can tell from his stance that he'll defend himself if you attack him, but you're pretty sure that, as he suggested, he will not make the first move. It's just too stupid. Ah, I could sabotage the peace process. And that was it. Obviously, the party would have followed Little One's lead either way, but they were all either unsure about the whole thing or fairly certain it was a bad idea. Not in terms of combat, but politically. There's no way to predict where their relationship with the Crown would have ended up even if they won easily, without casualties. It could have been fine, or they could have been blackballed completely for ruining this opportunity. And so the monitor snorted, turned and walked casually, visibly, down through the winding path, out to the docks, and plunged into the sea without another word, the messenger and their Vistrian escorts tagging along impotently behind him. The ultimate decision on the treaty would be made by the king, but that was weeks away, as messengers rushed out to all corners of the realm, trying to consult each of the counts, earls, and dukes before the Diluvian offer was made public. But that was effectively out of the party's hands. Angel did rush over to the battlements on the other side of the avenue, using detect thoughts to try and find out who had shot at the peace envoy. Scanning the soldier's surface thoughts, she didn't catch the shooter red-handed, so presumably he had made his saving throw, but several other soldiers had suspicions or mental images of one of the men lowering his crossbow after the shot, and based on that, Angel was able to locate a suspect who when searched by his sergeant, turned out to be missing a crossbow bolt. The motivation for the assassination attempt wasn't clear, but the man would face pretty serious interrogation before being tried on charges of treason. But that was also effectively out of the party's hands, leaving them with a decision about what to do next. So, Draven, how's that cure coming along? Slowly. I'm currently performing some deep research on planar energy. If I could get soil or other samples from the Shadowfell and the Feywild, it would help me to filter out the planar background radiation while studying the astral plague. Does that make sense to any of you magic types? Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, sure. What is an astral plague? It's not contagious. We should really contact the Basilica about that mission from Father Fields. Right. After we leave the court, I can cast Sending. You could do that, yes, but I think there is a more pressing concern. Mahara and I have discovered some kind of cult activity in the city down below. It's related to the Vampire Kings. The Vampire Kings? Here? I should hope not. The two followers of Anku had started by looking into some unusual religious symbols they'd seen people carrying around the refugee district, and had since discovered that a strange illness had been causing weakness among infants and babies, almost exclusively close to, but outside of, the tightly packed camps which housed most jobless descendants of the Verandi refugees. Wait, you're saying it's affecting babies all around them, but none of the refugees themselves? There have been one or two, but, uh... It doesn't take a genius. I don't care who's doing it, someone has to protect those children. So they descend from the old city of Castle to the much larger city which had grown out from the base of the Twin Mountains, not so much smaller than New Vanover, and they start investigating, adding to the info Zaheer had gathered on his own. Several of them try their own gather information checks, talking to people, while others contact the local city guard to see what they know about the string of mysterious illnesses, or the possible cult activity among people of the refugee district. 
Eventually, their investigation leads them to a longhouse where a suspected cult member is said to live. The building houses 20 people with tightly packed cots, but through a little bit of good cop, huge armored cop, they panic the cultist into revealing himself to Angel's scan of surface thoughts. They arrest the man and question him while Angel reads between the lines, learning that these followers of Cornello, under a charismatic leader, have been planting and burning a special kind of incense beneath the windows of young children during the night in order to help gather power for some kind of ritual. Having all been recruited from among the downtrodden, the people without a nation, the powerless, they had naturally been targeting houses in the slightly wealthier areas outside the refugee district, and they'd been trying to avoid children under a year old because they don't want anyone to die. Because Angel confirms the man genuinely didn't want to harm anyone, and since their investigation had turned up no evidence that any children had died of the mysterious illness, Draven and Black offer to do what they can to reduce the charges and penalties for this man if he helps them to find the cult's hideout. He describes the path they take through the sewers, and Angel gets a series of mental images of the path, or at least some landmarks along the way, before her Detect Thought spell runs out. So they turn him over to the city guard, and that evening, they head down. Most of the sewers of the city are relatively small, crawling height only. But as the man had explained, there is an older section where many of the drains converge into a larger flow, and where the tunnels were delved broader and taller, such that most of them could walk upright. Most of us. Though the refugees usually crawled all the way from the camps to the taller sewers to avoid detection, Angel uses her stolen memories of the route to find a place much closer to the goal where they can access the tunnels, avoiding most of the crawling. Soon, after some wisdom checks testing a gnome's memory, they locate the meeting spot, a couple shoddy wood barricades which prevent light from escaping a larger space. Peeking between the boards, they saw a couple dozen men and a few women, all in dark cloaks, listening to a pudgy, balding man. Not all of you will earn such a transformation, but if you prove your loyalty and worth to our lord, King Cornello, you will all gain freedom from your shackles of poverty and oppression. <sighs> These crates are all filled with some weird incense, like that guy said. The other odd feature of the room, which Angel can only see because she's standing on the ceiling, was an eight-inch high groove in the walls, a little below shoulder height, which seemed to be a trough for some kind of non-glowing, neon-green substance. Well, I'm sure that is a good sign. You just keep getting creepier. <laughs> Your efforts have been very successful, and we've already seen many of the donors recover from the temporary weakness, enough so that I now believe it is safe to expand all the way down to three-month-olds. Now, I realize some of you may have misgivings, but the increased purity and youth of their blood will dramatically accelerate the gathering, and as we've seen, the distress caused is not lasting. As they grow up in a new, more equal society, these children will not even remember their small contribution to the future of us all. Are we waiting for something? Do we even care what this guy says? Let's put an end to this. They burst through the flimsy door, and the cultists turn in shock, recoiling from them. These are probably all ordinary humans. Uh, how should we deal with them? How are you going to slash, stab, and burn all these people? Ordinary men and women whose position in society seemed hopeless, whose only crime is trying to reach for something more? Them? Only if they're dumb enough to attack me. But you? Searing charge! Oh, look at that. You tore my suit. Well, you know what they say. You break it, you get to be it. What? He's implying that he's going to make a new suit out of you. Well, good luck fitting his fat ass into my... <coughs> Little one is brushed aside by the immense force of this huge, bone-spined, worm-like body being expelled from the human-sized disguise, which had impossibly concealed it. This is the power granted to me by our Lord Cornello. Come, friends, let us expel these uninvited guests. A few of his followers were shocked into cowering, curling up in corners or beneath the pews, but most driven by the fear of being caught by the authorities, by the fear of disobeying the behemoth, by the sunk cost fallacy, and perhaps by a sense that with this monster on their side they can win, rush over and grab shovels, which they used to fling spadefuls of the green goo as short-ranged touch attacks. Little One and Black each get hit, but it does no damage, nor any other effect as far as they can tell. Angel runs along the wall and Mahar rushes in, they find the worm has a fairly low armor class and no damage reduction, so they should be able to tear it apart next round when they can full attack. 
But at the beginning of the next round, from a weird two-inch gap at the base of the back wall, big honking scarab beetles emerge, flying to swarm around any place where the surface of the goo has been disturbed, and biting and shredding at anyone covered in the stuff for 1d6 damage per shovelful. Anyone can spend an action to scrape the crud off themselves or an ally, which would reduce it from any amount down to just 1 damage per round, or from 1 damage per round down to 0. For the moment, scraping it off doesn't seem worth their time. Little One does get pissed off, though. He grabs the guy who hit him and rams his head into the trough, with predictably brutal results. On the other side of the room, cultists tried to get to the trough, but most of them had to pass through Angel's reach to get there, and with combat reflexes, her spike chain lashed out again and again, dropping the minions in rapid succession. Wow, you utterly murdered poor John there, and Murray! So callous. Black's oversized mace, Mahar's flurry of blows, and Draven's crossbow delivered a ton of damage. Wormy seemed to have about 200 hit points, but he was going down fast. On his turn, he only gets one attack, but he also gets a free, very strong bull rush whenever he moves, knocking people aside like twigs, and dealing a large chunk of damage to anyone who gets crushed between him and a wall, as Mahar found out. With a half dozen of them dead, some quite horribly, virtually all the remaining cultists made for the exit, and the heroes let them go, for now, since the real threat was pretty clear. If this guy weren't immune to sneak attack, he'd have been dead ages ago. Okay, I hit him for another 40. Sound lance. Take 47. Save for half. And they drop him, beating him till his writhing stops, and his hide dries and hardens, till the churning glow of negative energy in his maw dies down to an ordinary darkness, where illumination and shadow play once more. So they scrape off the goo and take stock of the place. What are we going to do about the beetles? There's a big one back there, like a queen or something. I've learned a new spell for just such an occasion, but we need to clear the room of any survivors first. And any loot. And of interlopers. Huh? Round two. Fight! Fight. The undead worm had sure looked destroyed, but within the dried up husk, it had been regenerating itself, so that now it burst out, rekindling the negative energy furnace of its core, which it used to swallow some of his men's corpses, coughing them back up as negative energy infused zombies. I freaking love being a worm! <laughs> oh. What does it take to kill this guy? I don't know, but I'm gonna find out. Yeah, he is not getting away with that again. You know, Cornello gave me a choice of spirit powers. There's nothing like this freedom! Damn it, I was hoping he couldn't talk with his mouth full. His speech seems to be magical, having little to do with his body. Besides, boom. Having grappled wow. him the previous round as a free action, Wormy makes one more grapple check at the beginning of his turn to swallow Little Ooh. One whole, dumping him down the gulf of unnatural darkness, which digests him for about 30 points a round of slashing and negative energy damage. Mahar and Black are pretty beat up now, too, having been crushed against the walls multiple times by the surprisingly agile bulk of the Bone Worm. Zaheer struggles to put out as much healing as he can without being crushed himself, while Draven keeps buffing and shooting and within the monstrosity, being sliced and drained of life, crushed under far too much pressure to swing his blade, Little One struggles to survive. Elder! Mountain! Hammer! Ah! Even that doesn't actually kill the worm, though despite being used with an unarmed strike, the maneuver did enough damage to break the warblade out in a single punch, and with their backs against the wall, in some cases literally, their full attacks punish the monster for the impertinence of having only 20 armor class. They beat it till it stops moving, then hit it with different damage types until they observed that its regeneration had ceased. The answer was positive energy. Healing magic. Then all that remained were the scarabs. I say we nuke the site from orbit. It's the only way to be sure. Blistering Radiance. Fire and Light bathe a 50-foot radius for one round per caster level. It's only 2d6 damage a round, save for half, but over a full minute the effect is devastating, incinerating the incense, the worm's remains, the beetles, and judging by the hissing shrieks, the scarab queen on the other side of the wall. They round up as many cultists as they can on the way out of the sewer, delivering them to the authorities, and having stopped the source of the mysterious illness, the blood-draining scarabs guided by incense, they can now turn their attention back to the task for which Father Fields had recommended them. Graven uses a sending spell to contact Thiswell, the gnome artificer at the Basilica. What is this mission all about? It's incredibly exciting. We've discovered the location of a powerful ancient artifact in the Feywild. Next time on Tales from My D&D Campaign.
Searing charge. <laughs> Seni Sushitsu.